Hi there and welcome to the fourth of my recommendation videos, my more or less monthly attempt to get you interested in literary works I particularly enjoyed. The theme of the last video was crocodiles, this time it's earthquakes, and I've chosen a short story, a memoir and a novel. So without further ado, let's begin. First up we have Heinrich von Kleist's 1807 short story, The Earthquake in Chile, which despite the title was probably inspired by the 1755 Lisbon earthquake. At this time, Lisbon had the reputation of being the most pious city in the Catholic world with some 200,000 clerics and innumerable churches. The earthquake struck while the faithful were at prayer, leveling the city. There was then an enormous firestorm and to top things off, a huge wave engulfed the port. This catastrophe and the response to it prompted Voltaire to attack the prevailing philosophy of optimism espoused by Leibniz and Alexander Pope that all was for the best in the best of all possible worlds as embodied by the character of Pangloss in his wonderful satire Candide which I also strongly recommend. Von Kleist however pursues a different tack in his story. The earthquake in Chile begins by recounting how a nobleman broke up a relationship between his only daughter and a tutor by packing her off to a Carmelite convent. However, the liaison continued and nine months later, during a procession for the festival of Corpus Christi, the young woman collapsed on the cathedral steps in the pangs of childbirth. This scandal, understandably, rocks the city of Santiago and the woman is sentenced to death by beheading. Fast forward to the day of execution and the young man is in a prison cell with a rope around his neck, planning to commit suicide by hanging at the precise moment that his lover is executed. However, then an act of God intervenes. A huge earthquake levels the city, the prison is destroyed, the woman is able to escape, and the couple reunite outside the city, along with thousands of other survivors, and are reunited not only with some of their good friends, but also with their infant child. There then follows an interlude where a new kind of society forms. It's rather like the Glastonbury Festival without the bands. After a few days, however, the couple take the fateful decision to return to the city, believing that all may have been forgiven. How wrong they are. They attend a church service where they are spotted by the congregation who form themselves into a furious mob holding them responsible for the devastation of the earthquake and then the sentence of death is finally carried out in the most brutal fashion imaginable. What really intrigues me about this story is the ambiguous nature of the earthquake because far from appearing the act of vengeance of a wrathful god, it rather has the characteristics of a miracle. Indeed, the woman escapes through an arch formed by falling masonry and in that brief period outside the city, a spiritual community forms where distinctions of social rank disappear and everyone helps one another. And this heaven on earth ends when the prevailing social order reasserts itself, signalled by the resumption of church services. And it's then that base human nature in the form of indiscriminate violence once more emerges. It's a hugely subversive tale and one I strongly recommend. My second choice centres on the Great Kanto Earthquake of 1923, which struck the main island of Japan, devastating Tokyo and the surrounding area. Now, prior to this earthquake, for example, in 1855, Japanese folk beliefs had prevailed, which held that earthquakes were not an act of God, but were caused by a giant catfish, an Amatsu, which was held under a rock by a god who occasionally went on errands, at which point this huge catfish would swim around causing earthquakes. And this explains this rather wonderful picture from the aftermath of the 1855 earthquake, where you can see Japanese citizens attacking a giant catfish. However, after the 1923 earthquake, Japanese rage was focused on a different target, the Korean population, who were massacred by armed vigilantes with the connivance of the authorities and the assassination of numerous left-wing leaders. And one person caught up in this turmoil 
was a young Japanese woman, the self-declared nihilist, Kaneko Fumiko, and she begins my second recommendation, The Prison Memoirs of a Japanese Woman, by recounting the morning of the earthquake. It began suddenly at 11.58 a.m., the 1st of September in the 12th year of Taisho, 1923. A violent rocking deep in the earth shook the Kanto region on which the capital city of Tokyo rests. Houses creaked and whined, twisted grotesquely and collapsed. Inhabitants were buried alive, while those lucky enough to flee in time ran about screaming like crazed animals. What had once been a thriving centre of the civilised world was, in the space of a moment, transformed into hell itself. One aftershock came, only to be followed by another violent tremor, and yet another aftershock. Fires broke out all over the city, and great columns of smoke billowed up toward the sky as from a giant volcano. Tokyo was soon under a blanket of thick black vapour. The terrible tremors left the population in the grip of fear. Then those outrageous rumours started spreading, and pandemonium broke out. It was not long before we were taken in by the police on orders from the capital security officials. I'm not free to go into the reasons for my arrest here. Suffice it to say that not long after that, I was summoned for interrogation to the preliminary court of inquiry of the Tokyo District Court. Before coming on to Fumiko's fate, I can't resist including here a fascinating snippet I found while doing research for this video, and that is the fact that the great movie director, Akira Kurosawa, was also caught up in the events of the Great Kanto Earthquake. He was a young boy at the time, and his father, hearing the rumours of Koreans on the rampage, ordered his young son to stand guard over a drain pipe holding a wooden sword, lest a Korean creep through during the night and slaughter the family in their beds. The next day, he went on a tour of the city with his elder brother to survey the devastation and saw masses of corpses. Despite the horrors he had witnessed, he slept peacefully that night. And the next day, he asked his brother why this might be so. And he responded, if you shut your eyes, to a frightening sight, you end up being frightened. But if you look at everything straight on, there is nothing to be afraid of. And what's intriguing here is that those words could have come right out the mouth of Kaneko Fumiko herself. Fumiko's fate was to be put on trial for high treason, along with her Korean lover, Pak Yol, for their part in a supposed plot to blow up the Japanese emperor. They were both sentenced to death. However, before the execution date, each was offered the chance to have their sentence commuted to life imprisonment. Pacquiao accepted, but a furious Fumiko tore up the document and said, I will not have my life taken away by the emperor and then given back to me. It's not his to do that with. You'll have to kill me. They sent her back to prison where she refused to take part in any of the prison activities until one day she asked to be allowed to participate in a rope weaving class where she weaved a hempen rope, which that evening she used to commit suicide with. While Fumiko was in prison, the authorities demanded that she write an account explaining her actions. And it's this text that comprises the prison memoirs of a Japanese woman. Now, I read this in its entirety before discovering another book, Reflections on the Way to the Gallows, that contains a compressed version of the memoirs 40 pages or so in length, and I believe this is a superior reading experience, and it focuses on what is the most interesting part of the account, the development of Fumiko's political consciousness. Rather than the earthquake, this compressed version begins with Fumiko's birth, which her father, a proud samurai, refused to register because Fumiko's mother was a lowly peasant woman, effectively rendering Fumiko a non-person and making it impossible for her to attend school. Her childhood was marked by abuse and exploitation at the hands of her family. One idea they came up with was to have a rich childless aunt who lived in Korea adopt Fumiko, so they sent her there. The art didn't want her, but exploited her even more mercilessly. And it was also while here that Fumiko saw the way Koreans were being treated under Japanese colonial rule and began to develop a sympathy for their cause. She returned to Tokyo, where she suffered further exploitation, this time at the hands of unscrupulous employers. This work brought Fumiko into contact with other marginalised members of society, and she began to explore various 
philosophical beliefs through her personal relationships. First with a Christian whom she had a sexual relationship with, he broke this off, fearing its consequences for his faith. She thought this was an act of cowardice. She then shacked up with a socialist who revealed himself as a hypocrite, living as he did off the backs of workers before she formed her first intimate friendship with a female, a student. And it was through this friendship that she first came into contact with the writings of nihilists, such as Max Stirner, Friedrich Nietzsche and Rudolf Steiner. And it was these writings which had a profound impact on her thinking, helping her see the pattern in the abuse and exploitation she had experienced. And here is how she described her beliefs during a police interrogation. As for the significance of my nihilism, in a word, it is the foundation of my thoughts. The goal of my activities is the destruction of all living things. I feel boundless anger against parental authority, which crush me under the high sounding name of parental love and against state and social authority, which abuse me in the name of universal love. And it was after this political awakening that Fumiko met Yak Pol, a Korean anarchist. They became a couple and began collaborating on political projects until the fateful day of the Kanto earthquake. There were two things I really enjoyed about this memoir. Firstly, it's an exemplary narrative of resistance. Fumiko emerges from the text as a truly courageous figure, prepared to single-handedly take on the entirety of society. And I must admit, I have a lot of sympathy for her view that society is simply a vast prison. Then, extrinsically, I was gripped by how many similarities there are with Heinrich von Kleist's story, The Earthquake in Chile. There is the doomed love affair. There is the suicide. This time the attempt is successful. There is also the mass hysteria after the earthquake. So yes, that part of it too made it extremely interesting and I strongly recommend you give it a try. I should note before I move on that for a Western audience, Kaneko Fumiko may be a name you've never heard of, but she is actually extremely famous in South Korea, one of the few Japanese to be honored as a hero of the Korean independence movement. And in 2017, there was a movie made of her relationship with Yak Pol called Anarchist from Colony. Okay, let's move on to my final recommendation. My final choice is John Fante's 1939 novel, As the Dust. There are many videos already up on YouTube reviewing this wonderful work, but for anyone who's not familiar with it, I'll briefly summarize. It centers on a young, ambitious Italian-American writer, Arturo Bandini, the fictional alter ego of Fante, and he's involved in an on-off relationship with a Mexican woman, Camilla Lopez. And the earthquake featured in this story is the 1933 Long Beach earthquake, which struck off the coast of California. And the point in the narrative at which it occurs is right after Bandini has committed adultery. And like a good Catholic, he blames himself for this earthquake. I got up and plodded through the deep sand towards the boardwalk. It was the full ripeness of evening, with the sun a defiant red ball as it sank beyond the sea. There was something breathless about the sky, a strange tension. Far to the south, seagulls in a black mass roved the coast. I stopped to pour sand from my shoes, balanced on one leg as I leaned against a stone bench. Suddenly I felt a rumble, then a roar. The stone bench fell away from me and thumped into the sand. I looked beyond to the long beach skyline. The tall buildings were swaying. Under me the sand gave way. I staggered, found safer footing. It happened again. It was an earthquake. Now there were screams, then dust, then crumbling and roaring. I turned round and round in a circle. I had done this. I had done this. I stood with my mouth open, paralysed, looking about me. I ran a few steps toward the sea. Then I ran back. You did it, Arturo. This is the wrath of God. You did it. The rumbling continued, like a carpet over oil. The sea and land heaved. Dust rose. Somewhere I heard a booming of debris. I heard screams and then a siren. People running out of doors. Great clouds of dust. You did it, Arturo. Up in that room on that bed. You did it. Fantastic writing from a truly superb novel. If you haven't 
read it, I urge you to do so. Now, before bidding you farewell, I want to share two more snippets I found during my research, and they relate to this Long Beach earthquake. Firstly, did you know it was this earthquake which launched the career of Charles Richter? Yes, the Richter who gives his name to the scale for measuring earthquakes. Now, another fact is that Einstein also witnessed this earthquake. Well, kind of. He was so lost in conversation with, of all things, a seismologist that he simply did not feel the earthquake as it happened, only realising it had been and gone when his attention was drawn to the swaying power lines and trees about him. Those pieces of trivia were drawn, like my brief aside on Kurosawa, from a wonderful book by Andrew Robinson, Earthquake, Nature and Culture. Can't recommend that one strongly enough either. I found it during my research for this video. And I've been absolutely gripped by it these last few days. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed these recommendations. As I always say, if you check any of them out, please come back and tell me what you made of them in the comments. It doesn't matter if it's in a month, six months or a year. I'd love to know what you made of them. But now I must bid you farewell. So until the next time, be safe. Be strong. Nanu nanu.